Robert Evans here, and we'll get to the Vince McMahon episodes in a second. I wanted to let you all know that for the fourth year in a row, we are doing our fundraiser for the Portland Diaper Bank. Uh, Behind the Bastard supporters have been helping to fund the Portland Diaper Bank since 2020 and bought millions of diapers for people who really need them. So if you go to GoFundMe and type in BTB Fundraiser for PDX Diaper Bank, or just type in BTB Fundraiser Diaper Bank GoFundMe into Google, anything like that, uh, you will find it. So please, uh, GoFundMe, BTB Fundraiser for Portland Diaper Bank. Help us raise the money that these people need to get diapers to folks who need them desperately. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Robert Evans. I'm, I'm the host of a podcast called Behind the Bastards. And like most of you, I was raised during the 1990s and early 2000s on a steady diet of World War II movies and History Channel documentaries about Hitler. Um, I decided as, a, as an adult to kind of make that into a career and just read weird books about the Nazis and other dictators and talk about them on podcasts. And for the last five years or so, that's gone pretty well. You know, every week I find a new terrible person. I read about him. I, I write a script and the show comes out that you're all duly familiar with. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I decided after a few years of every now and then getting suggestions from people to do a bastard uh, who was kind of from the it's not really a sport, but we'll call it from the sports world. A guy you've probably heard of called Vince McMahon. Uh, he is the owner of uh, more or less of the what was once the WWF is now the WWE. And uh, I kind of expected it to be like every other episode of Behind the Bastards. You know, I spend three or four days. I read a book, maybe two, do some research, put together a script. Well, uh, to my surprise, a couple of things happened. One of the things that happened is that um, when I posted that I was was doing this guy it got a response unlike anything i've ever gotten uh thousands and thousands of likes on twitter and uh wrestling twitter lit up over it there were news articles about the fact that i was going to cover this guy which has literally never happened before uh authors of books about vince mcmahon uh including the book uh, author of the book uh ringmaster which we're going to talk about a little bit uh by uh abraham josephine reisman hereafter referred to as josie reisman reached out uh people kind of lost their mind about it and i found myself putting together a script that is currently uh, set to be about as long as the ki- script on Henry Kissinger. And that may seem insane for a guy whose primary claim to fame is running a wrestling company, but I assure you it's not. He deserves uh, uh, everything we're writing about him. And to, to kind of help me wrestle this monster Can to I the ground. Can I just say I told you mm-hmm. so, first of all? You did. You did. You tried to warn me, Sophie. Um, uh, and For like <laughs> several years. Yeah. Um... So we're doing this, and uh, the only people I thought could possibly help me wrestle this thing into a manageable form uh, are two of the people I respect most when it comes to talking about shit like this. Uh, Sean Riley, a.k.a. Sean Baby, who you all will remember from the the legendary episodes that we did on uh, famous uh, karate monster. Famous um, Punani master. (laughs) Punani (laughs) master. Um, (laughs) Fucking, yeah. Uh, Yeah. Uh, uh, Sean, hey, how are you doing? Oh, it's good to be back. I've missed uh, you. I, I have I have missed you too, Sean. And um <laughs> this is uh this is gonna be a special one. And um I also wanna introduce Tom Ryman to the program. Tom's been on a number of episodes. Tom, you're also a big wrestling fan. Yeah, yeah. Uh very excited to be talking about Vince McMahon. I thought I knew everything there was to know about Vince McMahon, but the, the fact that you have such a volume prepared for us is making me think like, did I not know how much of a ghoul he was? I thought I did. <laughs> well, I think he's technically a business goblin. Yeah, he's oh, a business yeah. goblin. Business yeah, business he's a school. business monster. Um, there's a lot a going plus on four here. Business school. <laughs> One of the problems with covering Vince McMahon, it, weirdly enough, the thing that this episode is most similar to is writing about European royalty in the 1800s and 1900s. Because <laughs> sure. all of those like kings, <laughs> like Napoleon III or Leopold or Victoria, there was like somebody writing about every single second of their life and every decision that they made, right? So right. there's just this, there's so much shit to go through. There's so much detail on everything they ever did. And weirdly enough, it's exactly the same with wrestling. Like, Wrestle, covering wrestling is a lot like covering English or uh, European royalty. I was about to say King, Le- King Leopold had like a Dave Meltzer and a Wrestling Observer and mm-hmm. stuff, just <laughs> tracking his every move. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So that's part of what's going on here. And the other part of what's going on is that, like, as I started learning about Vince, there are all these other wrestler, like, wrestling probably has the highest density of, like, monsters of, of, of any, like, uh, entertainment industry sport out there, or at least interesting monsters, right? Um, like, there's just so many fascinating weirdos. Um, yeah, like, a casual wrestling story is like, oh, yeah, my friend was cranky, so he tore a guy's eyeball out backstage. yeah. yeah. You know, it's <laughs> it's because they're carnies. It's it's yeah. a carnival thing, and so there's this. It's way more hardcore than I think the more casual person realizes. Yeah, the more it, casual fan. So <laughs> every, every probably every episode, all of the first couple so far, we're going to be going on long digressions where we just talk about other res- crazy ass stories from wrestling. Because like oh, I felt I'm like so I was excited. doing a disservice if I didn't. Um, I, I wanted so to get like five right? Andre the Giant poop stories. We are talking a lot about Andre. <laughs> yes, I love Andre the Giant. Uh, he, not a Sweet. bastard, a hero, by the way. Just so we're clear, for sure. <laughs> um, I wouldn't let an indecipherable Ultimate Warrior mm-hmm. monologues. Yeah. Oh God. Um, I have been watching quite a bit of wrestling. I wanted to start by asking, what is y'all's background uh, with with pro wrestling? Oh, okay. Uh, Long time fan uh, since I was a kid. I grew up. Uh, I actually trained in pro wrestling for about a half a year and did. Oh wow. Uh, three three live shows as a character named Captain Party. <laughs> uh, I was a super powered frat boy. Uh, I, I did it here in Portland at the Ash Street Saloon. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah. And uh, let's see. I wrote three uh, video games about wrestling, three WWE video games. Uh, gosh, I feel like that's enough. That's Yeah, no, that's that's so much expertise. <laughs> a hell of a credit. You, yeah, I, I can't live up to that. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, now you're on. Now you're okay. on. Well, I mean, <laughs> like, yeah, that, I'm Tom. Like, fucking, I'll try. Um, <laughs> so uh, I also grew up watching wrestling, loved it mm-hmm. since I was a kid. Um, I was always more into WWF or WWE mm-hmm. than WCW. Um, I I was a backyard wrestler for several years. Oh, <laughs> Hell but, yeah. Uh, and and it, I, I definitely filmed um, one of my friends throwing another one of my friends off the roof of their house. And then that <laughs> friend doing a flying elbow drop off of the house onto that friend. Uh, that was, um, uh, I never went off the house, but I had some 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 fun bumps in a, in a backyard done to me as well. Um, I, I'm my, my friend back home books a local promotion. Um, it's actually how I met my wife. I met my wife what? at a wrestling show. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, no, I've my, known my you friend... and your wife for so long. <laughs> oh, okay. So, 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 my my buddy Jerry Stefanitsis books a, a independent wrestling promotion called Vanguard Championship Wrestling VCW in Virginia. And many years ago, they put on a show where they brought in Ric Flair. He was like a big man. Hell they yeah. were bringing him for the show. So Stolen it was a as a baby, by the way. I know. I remember that episode. <laughs> Uh, that's nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she she was uh, Marina was there uh, set up because one of the wrestlers, his mom ran this like new age sort of healing uh, a store studio and she had a massage parlor in there. Marina's a, a massage therapist. So Marina had a massage chair set up at this wrestling show. <laughs> and that's how I met her. I met my wife at a, at a Ric Flair uh, appearance Aww. that my friend put on. <laughs> well, that is that is a happier Ric Flair story than we've gotten lately. Oh, yeah, I mean, a lot of bad Ric Flair press recently. <laughs> Ric Ric uh, Flair spent the whole day drinking and then tried to stiff somebody else with the bill. That's that's what I yeah. heard from what that I, that specific appearance. But <laughs> I I have uh, so I will I will come in and uh, and say I have far less experience than all of you, and I, I think my experience kind of lines up broadly with like most kids in the 90s where like I was never like a huge wrestling guy I played a bunch of different wrestling video games in the late 90s early 2000s when like friends oh, would come mention, over for birthdays uh, huh? hmm. Robert I also own a WWF Superstar stand up arcade unit I, I should have included that in my oh, wrestling shit. credentials <laughs> <laughs> that is Superstars? awesome yeah yep Oh, sweet. I definitely played a bunch of that. Um, I was, I kind of, I had about a, maybe two years where I watched wrestling semi-regularly. Um, this was kind of, I think it's, you'd call it the Attitude Era, right? When Stone Cold Steve Austin was, yeah. was one of the big names and mm-hmm. the, yeah. Um, and I was brought in, again, it was one of those things, it wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't kind of like, 
it, it, I, like I made friends with a kid and he was like one of the few kids weird enough to want to hang out with me after school when I moved to this new town and he loved wrestling and old Star Trek right and so he introduced me to both of those things obviously the love of Star Trek stuck around longer but I, I watched wrestling like off and on for a couple of years and you know for years afterwards I'd, I'd play games when you know we were having a birthday party or something with my friends um, from what I have kind of read you know I didn't know this at the time obviously wrestling was just wrestling but 90 and 98, which was sort of more or less, I think, when I was watching wrestling, was kind of smack dab in the middle of, depending on how you count it, the third or fourth big American surge of interest in wrestling. Um, and the second of those to happen under the watchful eye of Vince Vince McMahon. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about that time, except for that my favorite wrestler was The Undertaker. Uh, I'm not sure what, like, uh, sure. wh where that puts me. Um, He's a good although pick. people say he was a great kind of like... Uh, uh, technical, you know, wrestler, good at backing sure. people up, good at the, good at the, uh, you know, uh, kind of pinch hitter for storylines and stuff. Terrific zombie. Yeah. yeah solid um, zombie. And Vince McMahon, I think it, for most of us who are kind of on the periphery of, of wrestling, who just sort of know it, you know, as a, in broad terms, is one of those figures in American pop culture who's just kind of always been there like I couldn't tell you when I first heard his name right he's like Michael Jackson or Arnold Schwarzenegger in that he's just someone who's always been kind of part of the foundation of pop culture for basically my whole life um, and in the decades since I you know was kind of into wrestling he's <laughs> become a major Republican donor uh, one of the few close friends of former President Trump people will say that he was one of the only people Trump would take his phone calls and fo push other people out of the room when he called while he was president um he uh his wife is a uh, also a massive influence linda huge influence on the direction of wrestling and also a uh, moderately influential person in american politics she was kind of the only member of trump's can cabinet who didn't have a huge scandal during his presidency like she was just kind of in there for a while and then bounced but there was no like she didn't do a mooch right <laughs> like there was no right. big blow up <laughs> um which i'm not saying is like praise for her she is a terrible person but like she's is savvier than a lot of the other people he brought in do you do you remember when the mooch went on like a following spree and followed like everyone it cracked mm -hmm. yeah that was a fun day that was that was weird that was a weird day <laughs> what a wild presidency <laughs> <laughs> we just you know, we just all blew right past it. <laughs> um but Vince is not just, and kind of the reason why we're doing so much focus on him, Vince is not just like a guy who is influential in wrestling. He helped create the foundations in a lot of ways of not just modern right-wing media, but like modern American culture. Um, you know, there, there's a strong argument that we may not get Donald Trump as president without Vince McMahon and specifically without Trump's time in wrestling, where a lot of people will argue he learned quite a bit. Um, the best book about the life of Vince McMahon is the recently published tome Ringmaster by Abraham Josephine Reisman, again, hereafter referred to as Josie Reisman. Um, early on in the book, she makes the point that wrestling is more or less inextricable from human civilization. Uh, I didn't know this when I started researching, but the biblical Jacob got the name Israel after a wrestling match. Uh, and the word Israel means wrestling with God, at least in one translation. Uh, so that's, sweet. that's kind of sweet. Yeah. You're dropping um, a macho man elbow on God. Hell you know that? yes. That's exactly how I think <laughs> that God. <laughs> Palestine does translate the leg drop. So, <laughs> 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 big, big, big boot leg drop. <laughs> yeah. So virtually every culture has some form of wrestling. Uh, and generally, you know, up until the modern era, these were like actual competitions, right? In which, you know, athletes were, you know, the, the end was in doubt. Obviously, like all sports people you know falling on matches for betting purposes has happened for forever but generally speaking it was supposed to be an actual competition um and while you know that was always a part of wrestling it also relied heavily on spectacle right this has always been a part of it now if we're tracing back the origins of modern pro wrestling the most direct place to do so is the french revolution of 1830 better known as the july revolution this is the revolution that led to the overthrow of the bourbon monarchy and its replacement by the house of orleans own. But that's, you know, boring history nerd shit. So I'm just going to quote from wrestling reporter Kyle Dunning here. It is said that during this time, wrestlers were first given nicknames. Also, the tradition of an open challenge being issued to the general public was born. There was commonly a reward of 500 francs to anyone who could knock a wrestler down to the ground. This is where circus has got the idea from. I wish we still had that. 
<laughs> this <laughs> happened organically to me once. Uh, I was at a, a Mexican uh, video game convention and uh, there was a wrestling ring in this booth that I was near. Just a weird little wrestling ring. Don't know why it was there. And uh, someone asked me to get up and say something. And within two minutes, I just sort of organically offered to body slam the biggest person they could find. <laughs> and then it, I just did that for like 10 minutes. And then one kid got in and it was like, okay, cool. Put your phone down. I'll body slam you. And then he attacked me. And I was like, oh, well, this, this must be how shoot fighting got its start. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, how did that go? <laughs> uh, he tried to take me down and then we wrestled for a bit. And then I kind of gave him like half a body slam, which he did not want. So he mm -hmm. didn't take it very well. And I, I realized uh, we got to stop doing this. This is, yeah. <laughs> this is escalating too quickly. <laughs> yeah, this could go really <laughs> badly. Um, I, I, I always there were back in the day, kind of one of the seminal moments in early Internet culture was the. Uh, there was this director of horrible video game movies named Uva Boll. You, yes. I, I think everyone is fam here is familiar with this story yeah. who got made <laughs> fun of by comedy writers on the internet a lot. And so challenged them to a fight, like a televised fight. Um, <laughs> And he had been, he had some sort of semi pro experience, he, right? He Sean? was he's like yeah. an amateur boxer. Yeah, yeah. Sure. like he's legitimately like a, a more built dude than the average internet comedy writer in the late nineties, early two thousands for sure. Um, mm -hmm. He did not, if I'm not mistaken, Sean, you you put your hat into the ring, and he did not want anything to do with that. I did. Uh, it's going to take like three or four minutes to tell this full story. <laughs> I want to be fair to you know, but like yeah. I I used to host a show called Attack the Show back in the day on G4. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I recently came back, but uh, and then left again, but. Uh, Uwe wanted to come on and fight Kevin Pereira and Kevin Pereira's like, dude, that's crazy. But wait, 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 I bet Sean maybe he'd fight you. And so they, they <laughs> called me. I'm like, fuck yes. Today, tomorrow, I don't care when. And, uh, and then Uwe's Zero people, training. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to prepare. I've been preparing for this fight my, my whole life. My whole life. Uh, <laughs> when I got the call, I did jump some rope. I'm like, all right, all right, let's, let's get into it. Uh, Drank some so, raw eggs. Yeah. yeah. Had a few eggs. And, uh, so Uwe's people like called me to get my stats and I was like, I gave him my stats. I was, uh, you know, a six, three, I'm like 210 pounds. This is not good news for Uwe Bowl. Uh, they're like, do you know how to fight? I'm like, yeah, I kind of know how to fight. And she's like, you know what? You know what? Maybe we're not going to do this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I found out later that he basically, I don't think he was like scared, but he was like, he's kind of a bully. He just wants to beat up on little nerds. He didn't yeah. want to like film Rocky four. So he's yeah. like, no, I don't, I want to like just beat up your smallest host. I don't mm -hmm. want to like stand toe to toe with a real man. Yeah. I want to beat up Richard Kianka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, he beat the shit out of that guy. He sure did. He uh, did. He did. It's, and, uh, it's, and we, it's, it's included as DVD extras on one of his movies. So I've, yeah. I've watched uh -huh. all the fights and it's uh, you know, we, we have since learned afterwards that low tax had it coming. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. He was, uh, uh, we don't, that's, that will be we'll, here. We all don't need to get into that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, he did offer me a spot in that. They're like, well, we'll fly to Canada and we'll do it there. And like suspiciously, they never followed up on that. But, uh, but anyway, that's the story of a way bowling. And then people say like, oh, he ducked me. And I guess he technically did, but, uh, I did, uh, go to the premier postal and, uh, I was like, I think it's only fair that I give him the chance to kick my ass. So I went up cause I'd already like <laughs> made fun of him in a couple magazines yeah. and I went up and he's like, yeah, I know who you are. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So like, so like, are you like pissed? And he's like, no. And then he just very, uh, it carefully explained all of my jokes back to me and how they weren't like real. Okay. I'm like, yeah, they're, they're fucking jokes. Like he yeah, did, I don't think he understood <laughs> even a beginning of, of, of what I was trying to do there. I'm like, yeah, I was making fun of you. The, the, the movies are bad. I'm not, what the fuck are we doing here? Uwe? I think, the, um, I think the, way, the way they framed it on the DVD extras that I saw was that, oh, he's, he's fighting critics. So yes, maybe he thought it was like all film criticism and not just like jokes. Mm -hmm. I guess. I mean, I was criticizing <laughs> his films. He was just like, right. you know, take, like like in Blood Rain, there's a, a love scene. And I was like, this is obviously directed by a man who's never fucked. And he's like, you know, I've had this, I've had sex before. Like he's like clinically explaining, like <laughs> my jokes. Uh, you see, man, you, Uwe Boll does seem like the type of dude that would need to clarify. No, wait, 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 wait. I have had sex. Right. It doesn't translate into my work, but I have touched a woman. 
<laughs> yes, I have I have seen the boobies. <laughs> I, I do like to think about him like getting in a cage with Ebert and then Ebert like pulling out like the Baraka weapons from Mortal Kombat. And just kind of <laughs> going to down on just him. him. <laughs> just fucking swords erupting from yeah, his wrists. Yeah, yeah that's so how I get, imagine him fighting. You never jump in on Ebert. You got too much <laughs> anti-air defense. <laughs> so um, I'll send you beyond the Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> This uh, this kind of it's evolution in joke. wrestling where oh, it, it. it starts to become <laughs> something that like, yeah, it, people like you're doing it out in public. People are like drinking heavily. You've got random folks locally kind of like showing up to fight, try to knock these wrestlers down. It becomes this circus act. This is what marks kind of the first really clear permanent separation from the various forms of competitive wrestling that had obviously been around for forever to modern wrestling as entertainment. Um, because obviously when you've got like random local drunks, like queuing up to be suplexed, the point is very clearly not measuring grappling skill in a traditional way. Right. (laughs) Um, By 1848, circus troops had adopted a new style of wrestling known as first-hand wrestling, uh, better known as Greco-Roman wrestling, which is not the way that the ancient Greeks or Romans wrestled, right? It's just called that. Uh, They had pants on for one. Yeah, they had pants on for one, uh, a lot less abusive in a number of ways. Um, It banned a number of holds below the waist. Uh, It also banned a number of holds that had, like, kept killing people. Um, So they were trying to, like, reduce the body count. Good idea. Uh, Circus troops in Europe quickly adopted but, this new but, style. <laughs> but not eliminate the body count. No, just not, they never get rid of the body count. Let's be very clear about this. I've been, again, I've been possible. watching old wrestling like from the 80s and early 90s with like Oof. my young friend Garrison. And one of the things we'll do in every match is like Google the names and see kind of who oh, made it the longest. Idea. Yeah, a lot of 49 year olds, you know, uh, tapping out of life in, in this sport, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. No, um, that's like not a joke. It's just a sad reality. Yeah. yeah. Um, football is not wildly different. So <clears throat> one of the things that's kind of going on here as they transition to Greco-Roman wrestling is that a lot of things like leg hooks are restricted, which were some of the most effective holds. And so because they can't do a lot of the holds they used to be doing, wrestlers adopted the tactic of throwing each other around the room uh, or around the, um, the, the, you know, the whatever, the square, which is obviously like another link, you know, in the chain to modern pro wrestling. The nicknames, fan challenges and increasingly elaborate throws that evolved over this period of time made wrestling more fun to watch than it had been before. By the end of the 1800s, the new sport had its first real champion, a guy named Paul Pons. Uh, he was a French His stage name was Colossus, and he became, by some counts, the world champion of Greco-Roman wrestling. That's what Wikipedia calls him, at least. The reality is he won a match sponsored by a magazine and then like another match sponsored in Russia, neither of which were really world championships. But he just started calling himself the world champion because like, who's going to argue with you? Right. Right. Like, this is b- before the Internet. You can just yeah, say things. This is before the Internet and you're giant, you know? Right. Like, yeah. no. <laughs> so this Big made us gave us blood sport. I'm, yeah. I'm in favor of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. fine. Uh, this made him famous and he opened a gym for wrestlers and for strongmen. Right. And this is, again, all kind of very highly tied to the circus. Still, the reality of the situation is that a couple of different countries had wrestling tournaments and winning basically any one of them would qualify you to call yourself world champion champion if you wanted because like there was no body that was sort of determining who was what was the real world championship in the early 1900s this is kind of the first time that we start to have what you could call a credible world championship um and the guy who wins it for the first time is a dude named george hackenschmidt who was legitimately one of the hardest motherfuckers to ever walk the face of the earth um basically unbeatable from 1901 to 1908 um how lucky how lucky is that name then Hackenschmidt Hackenschmidt it is and yeah. like I'm gonna have Sophie show you a picture of this dude in a second here Pons I'm is expe- I'm expecting a real granite faced son of a bitch he is actually kind of supr- in a pre-steroid era he looks like he's on steroids um he's, he's got one- a nice carpet of fur that's uh, no, no, for. no. He he is he is smooth as a oh. fucking waxed dolphin. Oh no, um, that's he's terrifying. Also, he's he's interesting <laughs> because he's kind of an old guy when he becomes. He's thirty four, which is like today even. That's kind of like pushing it, you know, by the standards of sure. athletes in the late eighteen hundreds. Sure, that's like sure, one hundred and three. Yeah, back then he might as well have been ninety seven. <laughs> yeah, uh, and he dies at age forty nine. By the way, and what would become a common pattern for wrestlers who came after him. 
Hackenschmidt is a uh, one of the first really shredded guys, as I said, in the modern sense to ever be photographed. And again, it kind of says a lot that he still looks jacked by today's standards, even though there's there's no steroids in this period. There's not I even mean, like a great understanding you, of muscle building. Why do you think they took his picture? Robert? Yeah, <laughs> they were like, like holy oh, this shit, is look amazing. At this guy. <laughs> it's also he's credited as the inventor of the bench press and the hack squat, at least according to a website called Barbend that repeatedly tried to sell me creatine. Um, I feel like somebody figured out the bench press before that. Yeah. It's not exactly <laughs> we super. Are, I found another website that says he definitely didn't create the bench press. Although I will say that website also tried to sell me creatine, Tom. Mm. So. So how much creatine do you have? So how much creatine uh, did you get? Clearly not enough, according to these two websites. Did you did you buy enough creatine to invent the bench bench press? Uh, not not yet. Um, but I'm I'm hoping I bought enough creatine to determine which website is more credible. Like whatever, yeah, whatever whichever creatine pushes my bench up more in like mm-hmm. a three week period, that's the website I'll choose to believe. This is how um, we will measure all <laughs> things from now on. <laughs> Sophie, I want you to show them. Like Hack and Schmidt looks like a crude dish ca- discount action figure from a grocery store toy aisle oh right? hell yeah like, oh look this at guy that looks dude. like he looks yeah. awesome yeah totally natty you have to assume because it's 1908 yeah. <laughs> like, no I don't think, neck <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, just, no neck he is necklace <laughs> he cannot li- put his arms down at his he side can't put his arms down to <laughs> he his side he looks cannot put his he arms looks like down. a he-man yeah and like look at those thighs this motherfucker never skipped a leg day we can say that with a degree of certainty <laughs> Uh, it's interesting looking loafers, at loafers, black yeah. socks. Yeah, incredible look. Oh, hell yeah. He's, <laughs> he's got the socks pulled up yeah. too. He looks like, like he a does professor. does look amazing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, this dude is like, it's like reminding me of like the difference between like when like Christopher Reeve or like Michael Keaton played superheroes mm-hmm. and then like what people yeah. who play superheroes look like nowadays. Like this guy's definitely jacked. Yeah. But like he's not Hugh Jackman in the Wolverine jacket. No, 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 like, no. No, like it's, it's Hugh Jackman, this, an X Men Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although he is a wide-shouldered man, he's so yeah. wide. Yeah, he is a fascinating-looking fellow. Um, so again, it, it, uh, basically, none of the creatine websites disagree that he invented the hack squat. So I guess we have to give him that. Uh, a different website that tried to sell me workout powders did argue that he didn't invent the bench press. And that article was written by a guy named Roger Rock Lockridge. So I do think we have to trust it because that's quite a name. Sweet name. Um, yeah. So Hackenschmidt yeah. racked up he, he, more. He oh, invented sorry. something. He invented yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Is um, the rock in quotes? Yeah. The rock is in quotes. Absolutely. Okay. I hope you do could hear them. Um, So Hackenschmidt racked up more than 3000 victories during his career. A lot of them were during he has a there's a 40 day wrestling tournament that he wins in 1900. Um, Yeah. So this guy, you have to assume pretty good endurance, Um, but he doesn't really earn a a pace of a place of promise in the history books until 1905 when he travels to the United States. Now, in the U.S. and the U.K., obviously, like in Europe, as we've been talking about, Greco-Roman wrestling is the big thing. In the U.S. and the U.K., it's still a thing, but it's kind of less favored than something called catch-as-catch-can wrestling, which is a combination of several smaller variants of wrestling rules that allows leg hooks, but also emphasizes submissions and mat wrestling. Uh, this goes viral in the U.S. because it made it particularly easy to allow challenges from members of the public at big outdoor events. Americans are drunk and love to fight. So you can't not have that, but also you don't want either to kill these guys or for them to seriously hurt your wrestlers. And so submission holds are something that wrestlers can train on and can kind of guarantee that they can win without like murdering a suburban dad by shattering his spine. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to picture the, f- the first poor son of a bitch that got put into like a figure four. Yeah. You would have, <laughs> you would have no context for that. Yeah. You're just no, like, what no. is that? Is this a spell? Mm-mm. No, it's like a medieval peasant eating Cheetos. It just blows yeah. your mind. You would just, you, you would just have a stroke and die. Like you wouldn't be able to wrap your mind around whatever mm-hmm. devilry was being Absol- done to your absolutely legs. Absolutely not. Point. Yeah. No, no, this was still a point. Of times I've gone back to my date after losing to a figure four leg lock. Like, oh, sorry, honey. I just, I thought I had him that time. That would have been my whole life back then. Mm-hmm. Just going out on dates. Like, oh, sorry, I'm going to go get my ass kicked, honey. Like, stop it. Come back to our date. You promised me you wouldn't do this anymore. In my whole life. The, uh, the, the evolution You know he's of- just going to wrap your legs up again. <laughs> oh my God, this time I'll turn, oh I'll turn him over. If I can flip him over so we're on our bellies, I'm reversed to figure four. You never listen to me. You think my ideas are stupid. 
I'm imagining like <laughs> early OSS men watching like a wrestling match and going, we have to, we have to figure this out. We have to put yeah. money into this. This is how we beat the Krauts. We got to crack this nut. <laughs> yeah. They've got like a stone cold stunner locked up underneath the Pentagon. Like we can't <laughs> oh, let this man. out. It's like the plague in the stand. If this gets out, we, anything could happen. <laughs> I've always thought you could measure uh, how good a lover a man is by how well he takes a stunner, like how mm-hmm. giving he is as a lover by how yeah. much he gets obliterated by the stone cold stunner, <laughs> which means that the rock does like a full backflip. I'm yeah. saying on record, I, I think the rock is a very giving lover. It's, yeah. I mean, honestly, Sean, it's the rock or Vince. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Vince yeah. <laughs> sort of does like a weird, like paralytic he to, quiver. Like, he used it, to do it better. He used to do it better yeah. before he blew his knees up. So Hackenschmidt's style and size made him pretty unstoppable in the U.S. for a time. He very quickly defeated the American champion of the day, a guy named Tom Jenkins, uh, in what was not a particularly hard match. Uh, Hackenschmidt was so dominant that a wrestling promoter named Charles Cochran took him aside and was like, hey, man, you can make a lot more money if you, like, fuck around with your opponents a little. Like, taunt them, toy with them, give people a show instead of just, like, beating the absolute piss out of them. Uh, In an article for E-Wrestling News, Kyle Dunning writes, in other words, he wanted to fake the contests to make them more competitive because the marks would keep coming back if they thought he was beatable. With this business philosophy, catch wrestling soon transitioned to become professional wrestling, and many other countries adopted the same, knowing there was more money to be made predetermining bouts for entertainment value. It all relied on keeping to kayfabe that wrestling remained a sport in the eyes of the public now again it's not as so th- this is kind of like flattening it a little bit obviously other people other promoters had been doing wrestling matches where the uh the ending was sort of settled ahead of time but that was not always the case and it was also a thing where like a lot of time in this day even if you were supposed to be setting up who's going to win ahead of time it would still like either egos would get her in the way or something and like people would actually just wind up fighting right sure um like this was a lot more common back then. Um, I should also note that the idea in this period that a major sporting event might be determined by something other than legitimate contest was not unique to wrestling. In early 1919, the Chicago White Sox conspired to lose that year's fall classic to the Cincinnati Reds. Members of the White Sox approached a group of gamblers and presented them with an opportunity to make a shitload of money. Uh, This did not go well. There's a huge grand jury investigation. Uh, There's a trial and major league sports gambling is banned until we realize that it was stopping a lot of terrible people from making money. This took about a hundred years. So, uh, the, 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 the fallout from this is significant. Um, yeah. Anyway, Hackenschmidt, uh, basically unstoppable in the U.S. until he winds up wrestling a guy named Frank Gotch. Gotch is an American who just was famous for having pretty incredible endurance. Um, It's unclear to me if their big match is fixed in one way, Um, but from what I've read, neither man is able to force the other into a clear submission for more than two hours. Um, (laughs) And that's that is a huge... So for for some perspective, in modern wrestling, one of the most famous matches of all time is an hour-long match between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. Bret Hart uh, these are yeah. two of like the best technical wrestlers of their day. They're obviously, this is not, they're not competing in the traditional sense, but if you yeah. watch what they're doing, it's amazing that they kept up that level of it's energy a, it, for an hour. An, it's an incredible yeah. match. Yeah. yeah, they are do, They are going, it is insane yeah. shit. Um, it was an one MMA of, match that went 90 minutes in yeah. the year 2000. That was Kazushi Sakuraba versus Hoist Gracie. Yeah. So, and, uh, oh, yeah. I love Sakuraba. He's the best. Yeah, the, gra- I, I, the freaking Gracie Hunter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think the point I'm making is that Hackenschmidt and Gotch must have been something to see. Two hours yeah. is still a significant if, fucking match. If, yeah. if, if, if Gotch's finishing move wasn't called the gotcha, I don't mm-hmm. know what he's doing in the carny business. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I feel like I don't know what we're doing as a culture if that wasn't the case. But I haven't found evidence of it, Tom. So <laughs> I'm, I apologize on behalf of America. Now, gotcha nuts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wrestling's charming right along uh, early 1900s but then you get that whole world war thing it disrupts the industry um obviously the kind of wrestling you know age men eventually do come back afterwards but the age that follows world war one is a little more jaded and one of the things this means is that a larger and larger number of wrestling fans start to doubt whether or not wrestling is real. The sport languished and a shady as a kind of shady sideshow entertainment for drunks and people from New Jersey until the 1920s. In the early 20s, a wrestler named Ed Lewis uh, is hooked up by his trainer, who'd also trained Frank Gotch, with a fella named Toots Mond. Now... <laughs> 
Toots Mond these comes from a fucking names, man. Toots Mob, uh, Mob these Mond. All, these all sound like old timey baseball off, players. Sophie, will you look up a picture of Toots Mond? They need to sure. see him. But second, I need to describe this man to you. Toots Mond is in the early 1920s considered one of the most out of control gamblers in the entire country in the oh, 20s hell yeah. like hell he is yeah. a mobbed up dude who other mobbed up dudes are like this motherfucker gambles too much and number two <laughs> Toots Mond, stiff competition Toots there. Mond is a dude who other men in the 20s are like this guy drinks quite a lot <laughs> like it is if it's probable no one on earth could no could drink with like this toots. guy today. I, I'm really I'm really excited to share my screen. Yeah, you gotta show you oh, gotta man, show these fuckers wait. toots mom. I can't, I can't wait to see this. I can't wait to see this hero. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Ready. This guy who other mobsters were like, God damn. Look, at, look at this man. Holy he shit. He looks like a giant baby. Yeah, this is an unfinished clone. Yeah. He's uh, not he's definitely not suits. done. PR dummy. Yeah, they yeah. paint those nipples on him every morning so people don't get suspicious. <laughs> he looks. I mean, he looks. Uh, wow. Yeah. Two sixty. Yeah. Six feet tall. Two sixty. I would have put him sl- at three feet tall from these. Yeah, pictures. he is a slab of meat. Look he at this dude. A profoundly unsettling man, and I'm only saying that because he's been dead for decades. Because I, I would be yeah. frightened looks, to well, make these comments if he were alive. You know, uh, he looks like in the face, yeah. not so much his build, but in the face, he looks like Brian Urlacher. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. gonna like say he, really he looks does. like a Cabbage Patch Kid, but yeah, <laughs> Brian Urlacher looks like a Cabbage he does, Patch. He does have yeah, resting Cabbage Patch energy. So yeah. Toots is they in call addition him, uh, to toots. being. Let me make it clear. They, they yeah. call him Toots because of his train conductor hat. <laughs> yeah. Which... yeah. <laughs> um, Toots is also a wrestler, uh, and so he acted as Ed Lewis's sparring partner, trainer, and security man. Uh, together, the two worked out a series of new holds and innovative wrestling tactics. They also would wrestle each other in the ring sometime during matches. Uh, these were, you know, obviously they had set these matches ahead of time. Um, both of these guys are pretty technically skilled, so Toots is the kind of guy that, like, Ed can trust, and they can trust each other to do a lot of these kind of, like, throws and tosses and not murder each other, and and, uh, put if together you, a you, choreographed spectacle, right? If you yeah. can't trust Toots, you like, can't trust know. Toots. Whom who can you to, trust? Who wants, who wants to stay in this world if you can't trust the the hard drinking, gambling out of control <laughs> mobster wrestler? <laughs> <laughs> so Toots and Lewis over time develop a new style of wrestling, and it's a hybrid of Greco Roman catch as catch can and kind of circus shit, which they call slam bang Western style wrestling. And this is kind of the most direct precursor to modern pro wrestling. Um, in a different article for E Wrestling News, Kyle Dunning writes the. The newly formed trio used their connections to persuade wrestlers from around the country to join their new promotion, so they no longer had to be controlled by others. Toots began forming what we would later know as sports entertainment, but the wrestlers had to be in on keeping it secret from the public. This new style of wrestling would incorporate elements from boxing, Greco-Roman, freestyle, lumber camp fighting, and theater. As traditional wrestling could go on for several hours, they implemented time limits to ensure matches would not bore the audience. They also introduced the concept of tag team wrestling, which had seldom been used before. Within six months, they had taken over the wrestling scene and were taking bookings in major sports venues instead of back alley halls and other small places. This um, just sounds like making love. Um, lumber yeah. camp brawls. I was about to say, yeah. I was about to say, excuse me, lumber is, camp brawls? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this yeah, is this a major, specifically up in the Pacific Northwest, a major form of entertainment where like you just go out and watch lumber camp guys beat the piss out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they are, they are very jacked and they have no money. Uh, they are Maybe all alcoholics. Be- they will fight for hard liquor. <laughs> Maybe they'll fight a bear, maybe yeah. a tree. I don't know. They don't care. They don't even know they'll the check difference. Check it out. Yeah. <laughs> and you know who else danger. will fight for your amusement? <laughs> to the death if you want, you know? You slip them a 20. The products and services that support this feel- content. Huge fans of blood sports. <laughs> yeah, they don't give a shit. Ah. <laughs> We're back. So, you know, lumber camp fighting, all this kind of stuff fuses together uh, to make 
uh, uh, slam bang Western style wrestling with, with toot, just, which Toots and Ed create. Um, I just I love that somebody saw a lumber camp fighting and was like, "This is close. America could, needs this, <laughs> but it's it not be quite bigger. there. Not <laughs> quite there. Should be on a national stage. Yeah. If this had shiny panties, mm-hmm. a couple of capes, <laughs> mm-hmm. and really throwing each other weird, wild distances, surprising yeah. air. That's what we need here. And I get a fancy guy with a mm-hmm. monocle. Yeah, <laughs> more guys in suits. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's not nearly enough racist caricatures. No one's dressed as a shake. So for one thing, we're going to have to fix that. Yeah, we got to fix that quotient right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is worth noting that around the same time, the late 1920s and early 30s, other people were innovating wrestling too, obviously. Like this is not a, a, a two person thing. Um, among other uh, innovations in this time, the flying tackle and the drop kick are invented, uh, which I, I love to think of the first man, like the Wright brothers of drop kicks. <laughs> <laughs> they keep failing at it like they're about to like leave for the day and then one more time just let me try one more time I, I know I can do it with both feet <laughs> yeah. I can get both legs up can you imagine seeing that for the first mm-hmm. it's like seeing the first the drop four kick? for the first oh my time. god like, yeah. oh shit yeah is he Icarus? Yeah, yeah. I think the next thing that will be like that is when they finally clone a mammoth. Like, my God, look at it! Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the timeline of human history is split at the drop kick. I'm gonna drop kick it. Yeah. I'm gonna drop and kick that mammoth right in the fucking snout. Oppenheimer Cloning watching the first animals. drop kick. <laughs> now I have become death, destroyer yeah. <laughs> of worlds. <laughs> That's all. That's all. Uh, that's all the bomb is. That's all mm-hmm. fission is. It's, it's mm-hmm. atoms drop kicking each other. Yeah, it's a. It's a. It's an evolution of the drop kick. So yeah. Billy Sandow would test new recruits uh, for kind of this wrestling business that they're building in his own private ring. While Toots would work with them on their finishing sequences. Um, this Hell kind of yeah. period is when they invent the concept of wrestling having a go home sequence, which is a uh, commonplace today. But back then, it was new and exciting to fans. Um, Toots also introduced the concept of the no contest and double count out, which moves wrestling away from kind of the old school competitive roots and. It creates a lot of possibilities for like storytelling, right? For ways that you can kind of end matches and stuff without people getting beat up too bad. And uh, uh, that, you know, opens up possibilities for all sorts of storylines, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and it's it's kind of worth noting just in terms of how innovative these guys are. Modern wrestling is still a very similar to what Toots and his his buddies create. And these three guys become known as the Gold Dust Trio, I think because of how much fucking money they make. And they basically are kind of the most direct progenitors of the modern pro wrestling industry. Um, they do a lot of fights in burlesque theaters, sideshows, and they kind of move on in a, really a fairly short span of time because of how much interest there is to stadiums and other massive, like, respectable venues. And wrestling for the first time spreads across the United States states, not as just like a thing people did, but as a semi-organized business in which there's quite a lot of money. Um, Now, Toots is the enforcer, in addition to training people and stuff. He and another guy, John Pasek, would beat the shit out of any wrestlers who tried to go into business for themselves. Um, (laughs) This earned them the nickname Hookers. That's what they're called for doing this. Uh, I'm not really certain why. Um, But but yeah, that's that's it. That old Hooker Toots! (laughs) I love that. I love that Toots just applied his mob training mm-hmm. to this. Mm-hmm. It's like somebody else trying to muscle in your territory. Fucking break his legs. Toots. There's not a problem that Toots cannot solve with a fucking drop kick. <laughs> yeah. So that's a lumber gold, brawl double threat when you can yeah, beat a guy in yeah, the ring yeah. and beat a guy out of the ring. That's uh, that's the total package. Just Toots walking into work. He's got like a briefcase and inside of it is just like a stump. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the trio eventually broke apart due to a power struggle, but wrestling was here to stay, and for a time, its shady reputation kept it down. Madison Square Garden initially refused to host wrestling events through the 1940s. Uh, what finally changes this is that Toots teams up with Bastards Pod alumni Bernard McFadden, who kind of invented physical culture in the United States. He was a big magazine baron, one of the guys who sort of started the modern like health and supplement industry, and he he provides Toots with the financial backing to expand this business, and because he's got connections, he convinces Madison Square Garden to start hosting wrestling.
wrestling events. Uh, in 1948, the first garden wrestling exhibition was held. It basically always sells out. It is a huge business for them. Uh, in that first match, a guy named Gorgeous George defeats a guy named Ernie Dusek. Um, that same year sees another seminal moment in pro wrestling history. By that point, wrestling has grown from being the business of a number of shady carny promoters and disgraced boxers to a network of promoters and what you might call like uh, cartel het leaders who ran wrestling in different cities and regions and generally hated each other. But in July, uh, on July 14th, 1948, several of these dudes gather together at a hotel in Waterloo, Iowa to talk. And I'm going to quote now from a book called Sex, Lies, and Headlocks. Uh, right around the room were P.L. Pinky... The, you're going to love these nicknames, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> P.L. Oh, Pinky yeah. George, a former bantamweight fighter who ran all the shows <clears throat> out of Des Moines. Al Haft, who liked to book big oh. games names in Columbus, but couldn't keep them for long because he was notoriously cheap. Orville Brown, a 250-pound brawler from Kansas City. Max Clayton, a genial mm. Omaha businessman who played only $25 for a main event, but made up for it by buying his favorite wrestlers straight whiskey and steaks. And Stone Tony Stetcher, who ran the Minneapolis Territory while managed managing his brother Joe, a three-time world champion who could dent a sack of grain with his thighs. Hell yeah. <laughs> At least, what an amazing thing on a CV. Who could not? What's it? Yeah. Dent a sack of grain, of grain with your with thighs? thighs? I, I, we must what be missing something. What a weird yeah. metric. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like most people could, but maybe grain was different then. Right. Um, maybe what, maybe I, a definition of bag. Is like, <laughs> Just sit I on the like, grain. <laughs> 60 percent of those guys have killed somebody with a wrench. Oh yeah, absolutely. M like but only thirty percent like of them remember it. <laughs> I <laughs> right. <did> <laughs> I love how like some of them are like, oh, this guy's the toughest guy in the world. And then one guy's like, I guess he can kind of you can tell he's been sitting on grain. Yeah, he and does a lot of like, grains, in real, real grain <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> Some right. real dubious honors in the crew is yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> So the dude who calls all these guys together in 1948 to talk is a man, a 42-year-old guy. He's a former sports writer named Sam Muchnik. Sam had lost his job as a sports writer covering baseball because his newspaper collapsed, uh, a thing none of us can identify with. Um, oh, yeah, what is that like? Even can't picture that. Yeah. Uh, he decided to deal with this trauma by starting to work for a wrestling baron and then becoming one himself. Uh, he rises to prominence fairly quickly and, uh, you know, he takes a little break to do some World War II stuff. But when he gets back, he finds himself frustrated by the fact that wrestling is kind of being held back by this vicious pack of promoters who are, they're always fighting and bribing each other uh, to like steal each other's wrestlers. And this is getting in the way of both their profits and expanding the business. So he gets all these guys together these real shady motherfuckers and he's like what if we set up rules together as the bosses of these different kind of syndicates to set up prices to like fix wages to blacklist wrestlers who go into business for themselves now this is very illegal they are violating the shit out of the sherman antitrust act but these guys are all criminals right these this is not the first right. law these people have broken this is, <laughs> this is mob shit this is yeah. classic mob shit. yeah this is very classic <laughs> mob shit and these guys all have a shitload of money so they figure they can bribe whoever they need to bribe he gets all these guys at the President Hotel to go agree to his idea, which amounts to something like the only union pro wrestling would ever see. And of course, it is a union of owners. Um, yeah. This goes on to become the National Wrestling Alliance. Interesting fact, there's another NWA that's like a wrestling kind of alliance that predates this NWA. Um, but yeah, it's not a it's not a, 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 a kind of big deal in the history. So anyway, interesting stuff. Um so they all agree on this. They form the NWA, this big cartel. The last holdout to it is uh, Muchnik's former friend and bitter rival, a guy named Lou Thez. Uh, Thez oh. eventually agreed to merge outfits with Muchnik and join the cartel. And Muchnik is like, okay, but if we do that, you got to agree to lose a title match to this wrestler the NWA likes called Orville Brown, right? Um, so this match never happens. Brown and his business partner, another wrestler that he'd fought that that night we're like driving home from the match they're like friends but they're supposed to be enemies and they happen to hit an 18 wheeler they may have been hammered uh and very nearly die this is a problem for several reasons because brown and his partner are supposed to be hated enemies and the fact that they're riding together in the same car creates a scandal i think they get fired for this uh it threatens to undo the fragile bonds of belief that made wrestling what it was um 
So, yeah, I, yeah. I think later on, a, sim- a similar thing happens to Ric Flair. He's in a plane crash with a guy yeah. he's feuding with and they had to pretend like they weren't traveling together. Yeah, I want to actually talk about this a little bit because like it's now fairly well known that within the wrestling world, this kind of mix of lies and theater to create this illusion of a contest is known as kayfabe, right? Um, there's debate over where the uh, the term comes from. Sex, lies and headlocks kind of credits it to turn of the century carnivals where these, you know, these wrestlers who would take on random random challengers, which they called marks from the crowd. Um, and like would wrestle them and stuff. Uh, You know, they can't, uh, you know, in that case, they generally know what they're doing because they have a lot more experience. But when they're wrestling each other, they can't go as hard as they otherwise might because one of them will get hurt if they do. So they rigged the matches in order to avoid getting seriously injured. Um, And they have to, in order to like kind of set this stuff up, they have to develop a secret language that lets them kind of plan stuff out um, in public without making it clear to others what they're doing, which is this kind of pig Latin dialect called Carney. Um, so one theory about where kayfabe comes from is that it's just a term from this little language that they made up. Um, initially, to initially, it's kind of a term for like, shut the fuck up. There's like Mark's watching, right? Like that's the initial meaning of kayfabe. But over time, it just becomes a metaphor for like, don't let anyone on on what's really happening. Now, we don't actually know that that's the origin of kayfabe. Nobody is certain where it comes from. But throughout the middle of the 20th century, this kind of whole language grows up around pro wrestling, as Josie Reisman describes. For nearly a century, this illusion was maintained at all costs in a kind of industry omerta. A heel and a face who were sworn kayfabe enemies couldn't be seen drinking together in their off hours. A wrestler billed as Iranian couldn't be known to be Italian. Even wrestlers themselves sometimes had trouble keeping track of what was kayfabe and what was not. So they developed two more terms. A work was anything that was kayfabe, and anything that was real was a shoot. Now, a couple of other notes here. A heel is a bad guy, right? It, it, like in wrestling, they're generally the guy, especially in this period, they're nearly always supposed to lose, right? Um, meanwhile, a face, which stands for baby face, is like a good guy, right? There's generally the people who are supposed to win in this period. That's going to change a lot over time. Eventually, you get to the point where like heels and faces kind of move up and down, and there's also becomes this kind of third category, and a lot of times the heels win because they're the people that like the fans like the most, but in this period, of time it's a lot simpler right um well there was a hulk hogan's kind of a notorious liar but like in his book he had a story about like he had a gun that belonged to one of the savage samoans and then they all had to go to jail because the savage samoans wouldn't talk in front of the police because their the wrestlers were supposed to be like these caveman monsters that didn't speak english so they could have like cleared up the misunderstanding about the gun but like, <laughs> to, to keep the kayfabe they all went to jail instead and I'm like there's no way any of it's true but like this is yeah. what Hulk Hogan said. I don't I don't know. I've heard that story from other sources than Hulk Hogan. Right? I don't know that like you you are Sean you are very correct Hulk Hogan is a famous liar. There are sure stories is. that crazy that we're about to talk about. Okay. So st- stuff on that <laughs> level and even wilder does occur. And, um, uh, I, I I remember reading about how uh, Ric Flair's wife didn't know it was fake until like yeah. deep in into the 90s. No, no. And it, there's a lot of that going on. Uh, I do want to note before we get into some of these stories, not all wrestling fans are marks. Over time, professionals split them up into smarts and marks. A smart is somebody who gets that, like, this is not real, right? These giant men throwing each other across the room are engaged in a performance. This is not really right. fighting. Uh, Reisman and other historians of wrestling, like, kind of traditionally, the assumption was there's only a few smarts. Most people are marks. Reisman, increasingly, and other historians of wrestling, tend to suspect that actually like most fans, particularly most adult fans over time are smarts. They're all kind of, it's sort of like Santa Claus, right? At, you know, there's a period of time where you kind of believe that it's, it's a real sport. And then you get older, you see something that breaks the illusion kind of famously Hulk Hogan, who again, take with a grain of salt. He's, he claims to have been a believer as a young adult, like to have been totally bought into it until yeah. one day as he's sort of like watching a match, he sees two wrestlers strategizing beforehand and has this like, horrifying realization that the game is rigged. <laughs> um, I'd be so embarrassed to tell that story yeah. about Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I might believe it because he's not a smart man. Let's be very clear about the Hulk story. <laughs> um, I don't know what you mean, dude. <laughs> Reisman also notes that while most fans were probably savvy enough to parse out the truth eventually, wrestlers for decades lived in mortal fear of breaking kayfabe because managers and promoters drilled into their crews that this lie is the only thing keeping the interest in wrestling and thus their job 
jobs alive, right? This is deadly serious to the industry, right? Wrestlers are kind of divided into, again, you know, you've got your heels and your baby faces and stuff. Um, one of the most interesting realities of um, early wrestling is, is again, kind of how seriously this is taken. You know, even though maybe most fans eventually figure it out, a lot of fans never do. Um, some of this is because guys like Muchnik de- would demand that their heel and face wrestlers never travel together, never act friendly together in any way. You know, if wrestlers suffered injuries in their regular life or got arrested and charged with crimes, which happened constantly, this would get worked into storylines on the fly. My favorite example of this stemmed from the 1983 arrest of Kerry Von er- uh, Erich, and we will be talking about the Von Erich family in a little oof, bit, but I want to read oof. a quote from the book. <laughs> dark Wrestle- dark yeah, story. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're ending on. But I want to read a book, uh, a quote from the book Wrestling Babylon by Irv Muchnik right now. Carrie and his wife were returning from their honeymoon in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, when U.S. customs agents, during a routine inspection, caught him with 18 unmarked tablets in his right front pocket. Inside the crotch of his pants was a plastic bag containing an assortment of nearly 300 other pills, including codeine, diazepam, librium, and possibly percodan, 10 grams of marijuana, and six and a half grams of blue and white powder. The Von Erichs yes, wove the ensuing... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a pretty good list of shit. The Von Erichs <laughs> wove the ensuing publicity into the world-class TV storyline, vaguely suggesting that Carrie had been framed by the Freebirds, their arch rivals. 18 months oh, later, yeah. after behind-the-scenes maneuvering, the charges were dropped by the Tarrant County District Attorney. Um, very fun story. So... <laughs> The wrestlers Rock, Express in this had period. These drugs in my butthole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With, um, oh, what's his name? Michael. Oh shit! I forget his name. The guy from. Um... Never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so um michael bolton you're thinking of michael Bolton. Yeah. yes i'm thinking of michael bolton aren't we all always i am so wrestlers didn't just kind of keep the fans you know try to keep this shit up for the fans they michael also Hayes. kept their own michael families uh, in the dark <laughs> maintaining the lie that the matches they were in were real competitions and that their fights with other wrestlers were real this sometimes caused dangerous situations an early heel named mario galinto was so hated that his wife feared for his life and so she started showing up at matches with a loaded handgun to protect him from his rivals and she would pull it on them and stuff like she would threaten them with it during matches and eventually promoters had to sit down with Mario and were like you have to tell your wife the truth she is going to murder someone on television yeah. <laughs> like this is a serious problem for us you need to stop marrying yeah. six year olds <laughs> she was blasts Paul Bearer or some <laughs> shit <Right. laughs> just empties a 38 and do him on fucking uh, like <laughs> channel 38 cannot yeah. kill what's all <laughs> she didn't when he tells her to th- the truth allegedly she doesn't speak to him for three days <laughs> so oh my god just destroys her that's kind of humiliating mm-hmm. but also right. like just infuriating like you mm-hmm. lied to me you also, lied to I'm me so stupid about wrestling <laughs> yeah. well i mean uh, she was in such fear for him that she was carrying a loaded gun mm-hmm. to his matches and he was letting her continue to do yeah. this he was like so, yeah honey i get it you're I doing a reasonable thing <laughs> they both missed a lot of red flags I yeah think. Yeah, this yeah. is maybe communication wasn't their strong suit as a couple, you know? <laughs> that's that's possible. Um it is, to be fair to her, it was super common for wrestlers to get assaulted and injured by fans. Uh women in particular habit had a habit of jabbing heels with hat pins on like their way up to the ring and stuff. Uh <laughs> men, meanwhile, tended to throw rocks and bottles at them. Uh Jesus. in one South Carolina match, a 78-year-old man with a knife stabbed Al Rogowski so bad that he needed more than a hundred stitches now oh my god al is a hard son of a bitch so he refuses to go to a hospital he drives himself back to his house he finds someone there to sew him up and then he wrestles the very next day because <laughs> i because i, cause I you tell go. you why wrestlers don't have any health insurance <laughs> they right. sure don't tom yeah. they are better <laughs> paid if, back then and he, um, and if he doesn't get any sick time yeah. either so if he doesn't wrestle the yeah. next day he doesn't make money yeah. so it's like fucking glue me up i'm going out yeah. there <laughs> i should note it is generally agreed upon by the historians i'm reading the money's better back then than it is now by comparison like these guys are making better livings than like modern wrestlers often tend to um which is kind of interesting to me um obviously that does you know it's it's different around the country that's not everywhere but broadly speaking it's easier to make an okay living then as a wrestler than it is today a lot of people will argue you got stabbed more often you did get stabbed more often for an example of that (laughs) 
Sean, Rowdy Roddy Piper claims to have been stabbed three times by fans who thought he was an actual <laughs> bad guy. <laughs> I don't if, I don't doubt it, man. Yeah, people, no, he he used to drive people crazy. No, they were. He was because he's he was he's a genius. He's an incredible yeah, actor. He's very, great. very, he's very great. talented at what he did. But also like just looking at Rowdy Roddy Piper, you have to be either ready to die or the drunkest I anyone has ever been to be willing to attempt to stab that man because he was a fucking yeah. monster. <laughs> and also his whole gimmick was that he was insane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. God, I love Roddy Piper. Um, you know, uh, enough to stab him. Yeah, I, I would. I would. I would Three stab times? him if it, would, if it meant he flesh. was back again. If we got one more episode of Always Sunny in Philadelphia with him playing yeah. the maniac. The maniac. <laughs> <laughs> what an absolute hero. You know what? During this next ad break, go watch the movie They Live starring Rowdy Roddy Piper. Uh, just a champion. We're back. Uh, I watched so, the entire They Live. We did. And we that did. Always Sunny episode. And that Always Sunny episode. Um, both works of incredible art. So, given all of this, it probably won't surprise you to hear that, even in the pre-steroid days, wrestlers often lived difficult lives. One of the first great modern wrestlers was a guy named Gorgeous George. Uh, he was the son of a house painter. He played a narcissistic healer, heel who was one of the first big popular TV wrestlers. Uh, he would prance around the ring in a fur robe. Uh, he was kind of a little like queer coded kind of bad guy thing, right? This is, you know, the 60s. Uh, he gouged eyes. He flirted with audience members and he just like chewed the fuck out of the scenery. George is a huge hit in like the 50s and kind of early 60s. But by the time he retires in 1962, the heavy drinking that came with his career field, because uh, I mean, it's part of just what these guys do to deal with the pain, because they're, you know, it's not easy on your body, had destroyed his health. Uh, when he retires, he like uses the money he has to start a bar in Van Nuys, but his medical bills quickly force him to sell it. In 1963, after a night of bumming drinks from the bartender in the bar he used to own, he dropped dead from a heart attack. He was 48 years old. Um, in Sex, Lies, and Headlocks, the authors note, the wrestlers he'd once worked with pass around a hat to help bury him in an orchid-colored casket, beside which his last girlfriend, a stripper, collapsed crying. It is a very wrestling funeral. Um, he is not the only guy with a story is, like this. I uh, know, yeah. That it's is, a bummer. That is yeah. dark. I mean, not that his girlfriend is a stripper, that's whatever, but just like, this is like, his story is not uncommon. No, you know? I mean, it's dark yeah. that they had to pass around a hat yes. to pay for his casket, and he, he yeah. collapsed bump, begging for drinks in the bar yeah. he used to own. That's yeah. dark. It is dark. It is, a, and again, a lot of these promoters are just straight up monsters. There are more of them who are kind of decent guys in this period. There are a number of like regional promoters who will do shit like when their wrestlers have health problems after retirement, divert funds from their business to like pay for their health care. I'm not saying that's the norm, but it does happen. And it's also, there is strong solidarity with kind of wrestlers where stuff like this is not the taking up collections to help old and in injured wrestlers pay for medical treatment or pay for funerals. That stuff happens with a significant degree of frequency in this period of time. There is kind of this understanding that like, you know, this is a tough job. We're all kind of going to destroy ourselves doing it. And we have to have each other's back, you know? Um, so given the cultural values of the time, good guys and bad guys in wrestling had to be very easy to separate on black and white TVs. In the 1950s and 60s, this often meant that your bad guys are going to be either communists or Nazis, right? Very easy way to you know, make it clear. Villains. Yeah, exactly. An early Russian wrestler, Boris Malenko, was actually a Jew from Jersey named Larry. Um, but, you know, <laughs> he could do an accent, that's, right? That's also an extremely <laughs> common wrestling story. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Uh, for example, the Sheikh of Araby, who prayed to Allah before each fight, was yeah. a Detroit native named Ed. Uh, <laughs> and one of the first great Nazi wrestlers was Jack Adkison, better known as Fritz von Erich. Now, yep. but he again, was guys, a real Nazi, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> the focus of this series is Vince McMahon, obviously, okay. um, you know, but wrestling is always traded on brutality and mortgaging human bodies for entertainment. And I don't want to just focus on the ways Vince did that, because that's going to give people this attitude, which is sometimes gets put across by like wrestling fans that like before Vince, things were a lot better. 
you know, some stuff was, no, but no, no, no. this has always been a pretty brutal business. Um, so we're going to talk for the rest of this episode about Fritz and the Von Erich family. You guys both had a reaction when I brought them up. So I think you yeah. might know this story. Oh, There's yeah. a lot of yeah. sadness in the Von <laughs> yeah. Erich story. It's By uh, God. really, really tragic. <laughs> it is a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so Fritz slash Jack, and we're just going to call him Fritz from now on, had been trained by the founder of one of the first great wrestling dynasties, Stu Hart, a uh, Canadian from Edmonton, whose dungeon, that's what it's called, the dungeon, was the most celebrated training center, center for wrestlers of its day and for like generations to come. This is like, they remain very big. Um, Bret Hart, we talked about a little bit earlier, is like one of his kids and, you know, trains there. Um, Hart trained fit, uh, Fritz and gave him his stage name. And you might think that having your like mentor be like, hey, you've got serious Nazi vibes to me. Why don't you wear a fucking swastika into the ring? Well, would make you reconsider aspects of your life. But Fritz is so. like, yeah, man, for sure. That sounds great. <laughs> he you, would you wrestle. Pay me how much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fifty dollars a night for sure, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Fritz would wrestle wearing Nazi regalia. Um, his trademark move was the Iron Claw, and he has the distinction of having been wrestling Lou Thez, who we've talked about before. He's kind of one of the big, great big early champions. He and Thez are wrestling the day that JFK gets assassinated. Um, there's not as much great footage of him in the ring uh, as I'd like. Related? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, definitely a causal relation. Um, there's not as much great footage of him as I'd like, but I found a clip of his brother, Waldo Von Eric. Waldo's not his real brother. This is a kayfabe thing, right? They, Waldo is another guy who trains at the dungeon, and they're like, you know, match brothers. And Waldo was also a Nazi. This clip is from a, uh, a match in 1975, and it is remarkable. I should note before we start that his opponent here is Jay Strongbow, uh, who is mm. a, a Native American wrestler who wrestles in a full headdress. He's actually an Italian. Uh -huh. um, yeah, not an uncommon story. <laughs> so here's a here's here's Waldo von Erich being a Nazi and as he comes in the ring he is wearing a stall helm I should note boy he sure is yeah he is he is wearing a Nazi helmet and yeah. a uh, sleepless shirt uh, he's got a writing crop in his hand and he's got in the front of his shirt is a there's a Nazi logo like the okay. uh, Nazi but like, eagle one. Here comes shirt. the Italian man in the native headdress. <laughs> and then there's the Italian man yeah. in the native headdress. <laughs> Chief J. Strongbow. Mm -hmm. The pride of Oklahoma. Uh, from, from, from Tuscany. <laughs> I, I, old timey wrestlers, I do love the, the gay coded fancy man and yeah. the, the Indian chief are like my yeah. two favorite like problematic mm -hmm. characters. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You get some. I love. Yeah. I love that Waldo's swastika. You can tell they weren't into drawing it. I also love, you know, steroids are starting to be a thing in the 70s, but they haven't figured them out great. So these guys are just huge dudes with beer bellies. Oh, he's doing Wait, a, a Nazi yeah, salute. The Nazi yeah, salute. there it was. Oh, there it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, so, the Iron Claw, if the audience doesn't know, is kind of like a Nazi salute on the human face. You just you put, <laughs> you grab the front of their head and you just squeeze it. Mm -hmm. uh, Glorious. Impossible to escape. I mean, yeah. Palming someone on the face, yeah. Just yeah, uh, how do you get out of that? Just rough. You could just walk rough. backwards to the mm -hmm. side. No one thinks of that. Mm -mm. No, mm -hmm. no. no when, you get, when, you gets, when you get sig heiled right in the forehead, you, you mm -hmm. sort of like it knocks all thoughts out of your brain. That's, so you're like, what do right. I do? That's why Hitler adopted it. Famous, famously great technical wrestler Adolf Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> so. I will know everything he knows. It's actually this how he is, took himself out. He, he he just did the iron claw to himself. At the this bunker. match between Jay Strongbow and Waldo problematic. Not even close to the most racist wrestling match that that you can find. Like, oh, like it's not even the most ra decidedly racist. mid. <laughs> it's not even the most racist wrestling match I've seen recently. No, yeah, that bounced right off my brain. If you hadn't yeah. told me, yeah. hey, we're we're looking at this in, uh, for racism, I would have been like, this is totally normal old timey wrestling. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah, at <laughs> least the Nazi is supposed to be the bad guy. <laughs> a Nazi and an Indian chief. Honestly, they're doing pretty good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, Fritz himself has a. 
as we've discussed, as we're, yeah, just, just a nightmare of a life, um, but because he's a terrible person. So uh, his, you know, his first son, this is not his fault, probably, Jack Jr. dies in 1959 from accidental electrocution that leads to drowning. Um, obviously, uh, it, this has an impact on Fritz, and he decides to stop wrestling on the East Coast. Uh, as kind of a result of this, he becomes the godfather of Texas wrestling, overseeing a company that runs wrestling in Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio called World Class Wrestling. Uh, Fritz continued to re or reinvested the money that he made from wrestling into real estate. He's one of the guys in this who's actually like good with his money, and while he's making it as a wrestler, puts it into something that's going to make him more money. Um, unfortunately, he's also a giant piece of shit and kind of a real fascist because one of his best friends is Pat Robertson. Uh, he is a born again Christian who becomes a major right wing donor in Texas and a moral crusader. Um, so that's great. Uh, Sweet. Yeah, good guy. So he has four sons, uh, three of whom are four more sons, three of whom at least are groomed to follow in his footsteps, even though several of them lack the talent or the physique to do so. Spoilers, uh, when you said three of whom, I thought you were going to say something else. Yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> that's where we're going, more Tommy. Horribly than electrocuted <laughs> and drowned. Uh huh. We're so starting it with electricity. He's, he's and down the same one time boy and so far, sad. right? Yeah. He's got he's he's one out of fives son. already out of the match. Um, Did you so, do a show on Pat Robertson? Uh, we've covered him before. We've covered okay. a lot of aspects of him, yeah. Uh, his dream was to create a wrestling dynasty in imitation of Stu Hart, right? Uh, and as <laughs> wait, wait, Pat nerd- Robertson's? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, maybe, but definitely, Fritz. definitely Fritz. Um, and as wrestling nerd Nicholas Allhelm writes, by the time Kevin, David, and Carrie, his three uh, large adult sons, entered their teens, they were put into grueling workout sessions by their father. Despite time uh, playing a variety of junior high and high school sports, he would work them out for another three hours after school every day. While the boys grew up in wrestling and knew wrestling, it was clear that their father wanted to make it clear they didn't have a choice. Their future was wrestling, whether they wanted it to be or not. Cool. And, yeah, so, yes. you know, he's kind of like the Michael Jackson of wrestling, uh, or Michael Jackson's dad of wrestling, yeah, I should Michael say. Jackson's I always, dad, I always forget Joe that Jack- guy's Joe, name. Joe, Joe Jackson. Jackson. Yeah. Right, Joe Jackson. Um, but maybe, like, honestly, Joe Jackson's a better dad, uh, which is, <laughs> like, that. that's a, a heads up as to where this is going. <laughs> the only um, one of his kids are dead. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a really dark, like... 2000s yeah. era joke punchline. Joe yeah. Jackson's a better dad. He, I mean, <laughs> he's got a better fucking record. So, for a time, the Von Erichs are very successful. In the early 1980s, his boys are all actively in the ring. They are hugely popular in Texas. By this point in kayfabe, Fritz has been revealed by his nemesis Gary Hart to have been a normal Texas boy, not a Nazi allowing him to turn babyface. Yes. This made kayfabe a little easier for his boys because they didn't have to wear sweatshirts swastikas but since their dad is the booker and they're the stars he gets to run them mercilessly right the entire company is because these guys are big stars the their entire company is reliant upon them performing basically every night during parts of the year in order to keep attendance high at the venues that he booked because they're such a necessary part of the business when they get hurt which happens a lot they can't take the next night off so dad just starts handing them fucking painkillers like they're skittles in order to keep them performing yeah. uh, another thing that it's like, a, it's, like a band-aid. it's like a band-aid. And, and we'll go back when we talk more about Vince. We'll talk about how steroids become a part of the industry. But steroids are a big part of the industry by the uh, the 1980s. And so in order to compete and again to keep crowds butts in seats, they have to bulk up to Hulk Hogan like levels and the drugs that they're taking take a toll on these boys' bodies. And after a 1984 match in Japan, David Von Erich is found dead in his hotel room at age 25. Um we don't entirely know what happened. His friend Bruiser Brody claimed once that they flushed a bunch of drugs down the toilet after finding his body and basically that he OD'd. I think the family denies this. It's not really clear what happened because after he makes this claim, Bruiser Brody gets stabbed to death in Puerto Rico. Uh, he sure so does. <laughs> we don't get a lot of detailed confirmation either Ooh, way. <laughs> is there a reasonable like counter explanation? It's like, oh, no, he's not really. a bunch of drugs. <laughs> not not really. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's the okay. kind of thing where, like, uh, you know, today, 
like any leading man and stuff who's doing big action roles is on something that we can call steroids pretty much. Sure. But also we've gotten a lot better at doing it without killing people, which is not, I'm not saying people should do steroids, but if you have millions of dollars and doctors who are constantly monitoring your blood levels and doing tests on you and stuff, it's not as dangerous. Like these guys are just kind of well, shot shooting shit up their asses and seeing what happens. You know, it's right. a combination of things too. You know, the road list, it's all the hard drinking and popping painkillers. Yeah, you take you a shit go to the doctor. Cuff. Yeah. You just have, to keep going mm-hmm. like yeah i think they tour something like i don't know 300 yeah. days a year um yeah so it's a it's a combination of all that shit yeah yeah it's it's just it's a different time and it's even again don't do don't do steroids folks but it's even much worse for you at this point in time even um and yeah they're also coke is as common as roids are because i mean it, part of what a lot of wrestlers just say is that like yeah you know in order to get into the ring and get amped up you got to get fucking coked up um and then to calm down and to deal with the pain you take painkillers and then often to get to bed you add alcohol to that a lot of guys od as a result of that shit. I mean, know, but, it's yeah. never, I, I mentioned ultimate warrior earlier, but never has you need cocaine to get hyped up for oh, the yeah. match been, been more <laughs> obvious than an no. ultimate warrior entrance. <laughs> no, there, there are, there are like cult cartel warehouses in fucking Sinaloa that have less cocaine than was in his bloodstream. And he given like, night, like he was <laughs> gliding out there on a, on a board of cocaine, like yeah. ice man, <laughs> just an incredible man. Just, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, very tragic death. Obviously, he's fucking 25. He barely, you know, had a life. Uh, very sad. Uh, the Yellow Rose of Texas, as David was known, was mourned by a crowd of 3,000 people at his memorial service. Uh, Fritz, though, made sure to profit from this, selling color photos of his dead son that had once gone for $3 for $10 at the memorial service. <laughs> Hell yeah. Right Hell after yeah, he set his one of his surviving sons, Carrie Von Eric, to wrestle Ric Flair for the world title. Because kind of everybody's sorry, you know, because David died, uh, they set it up so that Kerry, you know, wins this match, right? Which is, again, not uncommon in a case like this. You've got someone Um, whose brother just died. You give them a belt, you know. I'm yeah. surprised like Fritz didn't open up the casket and let people take pictures with David for like 20 <laughs> bucks or cut something. Cut off hair. Bucks. Yeah. 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 Take 35 to get a lock of his yeah. hair. Yeah. 30 bucks. So the what do you got? What do you got? Year. Let me see your money. Let me see your money. <laughs> right, it's, yeah, it's barely better than that. Tom. <laughs> yeah, right. Get up it's there. 40 for a thumb. It's 40 for a thumb. That guy took a thumb. Get the extra 10 bucks. The, uh, don't, don't let that dude leave. The next year in 1985, (laughs) Mike Von Erich was charged with two counts of misdemeanor assault against an ER doctor he got into a fist fight with during a trip to the hospital. Shortly Mm -hmm. thereafter, he goes to Tel Aviv to wrestle, and he takes a bad bump to his shoulder that dislocates it badly enough that it requires surgery. Due to either poor hygiene or bad luck, after surgery, he contracts toxic shock syndrome, which is very serious and very uncommon, just like in general it's not something men get off and it's certainly not a common side effect of shoulder surgery. Um, he gets transferred to a hospital with 105 degree fever and his kidneys shutting down. The upside of this Jesus. is that he is too weak to punch another doctor. So that might've helped. <laughs> so the outcome. doctor lived through that. <laughs> so the doctor mm-hmm. survived and he does. Uh, and while his son is fighting to survive, Fritz starts like making, he goes to the press basically, you know, never waste an opportunity. He tells uh, the media that the number of calls from fans to the hospital outnumbers the calls that a neighboring hospital had received when JFK was sent there in 1963, oh which is an insane flex. That's a, <laughs> that's a real, if anybody, if anybody <laughs> wants a bag of bloody stool, 70 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Let me see your money. Right. Yeah, you get in there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real, it's real, it's real Trump saying now yeah. I have the tallest building in New York yeah. City. Yeah, it's it's wild stuff. Yeah. Uh, Mike, do, uh, his, Mike does pull through. He survives this, uh, and his brother Kevin gives a press conference calling his survival a miracle. Alas. He takes, he's permanently injured from this, right? Uh, his weight drops down to just 145 pounds. He is now lo- no longer able to speak without slurring his voice. Um, mm. He just, like, he, he doesn't recover from this. Uh, Muchnik writes, quote, Fritz lost no time in repackaging him for the wrestling marks. Mike was nicknamed the living miracle. Fans were promised that he would defeat the odds, wrestle again, and claim a championship for God and family. To give the gimmick momentum, Mike was wheeled out in a car to wave to the 25,000 fans at the big October show at the show at the Cotton Bowl. He made his official return to the ring on July 4th, 1986. By then, you, you want to kiss him? You want to kiss him 60 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> so when he comes back to the ring, he's also contracted hepatitis, oh and his God, dad's just, just like, get him out there! Get Christ. him out there! 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's so bad. Go, go um, share some blood with that fella. <laughs> yeah. So the next year, 1986, another prominent wrestler, Gino Hernandez, dies of a cocaine overdose. Uh, now, this happens right after a TV spot where Hernandez, a heel, had blinded babyface wrestler Adams. And it says a lot about wrestling in this period that the announcer, Bill Mercer, Fritz's employee, announced Gino's real life death on television by saying, we have suffered two terrible tragedies in the last week, the blinding of Chris Adams and the death of Gino Hernandez. Does. <laughs> Equally like, uh, fake tragic. blinding in a real these are, <laughs> these are equivalent tragedies. Yeah, thanks to K Fabe, they're the same thing. Uh. <laughs> So the next year, Kerry Von Erich, wasted as hell, rams into the back of a police car on his mer- motorcycle. Uh, his foot is, like, part of his foot it winds up eventually oh. getting amputated. It is a yeah. nasty wreck. Doctors spend 13 hours putting his limb back together, and then he is immediately whisked away to perform in the fucking ring. Oh my God. Um, yeah, it's a nightmare. Uh, I'm he, gonna didn't go- he, res- he wrestles with a fake foot for a while, doesn't he? Yeah, he sure does, Tom. He sure fucking does. Damn. Um, um, I'm I'm gonna quote again from Mushnick here. <laughs> Sorry, Fritz is just smashing these kids He's to pieces. A like again, when, Joe Jackson might be the better dad. I'm. Just- <laughs> <laughs> Quote, his opponent this evening was carefully instructed to sell for Kerry, for it was clear in advance that the man who was once among the most agile 250 pounders in wrestling would be virtually immobile. Still, they had to make a good show of it. So while Kerry changed into his trunks, a doctor filled a syringe with enough Novocaine to numb Secretariat's hoof. Thus fortified, Kerry discarded his crutches, gritted his teeth, and hobbled into the ring. The match Ugh. lasted five minutes, and as planned, Kerry won. Afterwards, when the Novocaine wore off, an examination revealed that the ankle had rebroken. Four months Ooh. later in another operation, the foot was permanently fused into a walking position. Like oh, ba- that's, bad, that's bad right. dad. Don't think, think of the chronic pain that <laughs> dude must have had. Like his calf must just cramp up 20 times yeah. a day. Now look, I'm not a big giving people parenting advice, but uh, free parenting advice from Robert here. Don't do this to your kid. Yeah. <laughs> don't do this. Not good. Not good. Not good being a dad. Um, yeah. When my daughter got her <laughs> foot, her first foot torn off, I was sure. like, we're going to wait two weeks before you get back in that. <laughs> yeah, right, two solid weeks because you're yeah. a good father. Absolutely. Yeah. I do yeah. my best. So despite Fritz's the cocaine pushing, helped. I, <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, well, yeah, of course. Kids love cocaine. You know, you just tell them it's one of those uh, fun, fun bag. What do they, what do they call that shit? Fun dip. You know, they love that <laughs> shit. God, that'd be good. A fun dip bag of cocaine. That's what I'm going to have after we get finished. fun dip has my mouth numb. I can't taste it anymore. That means it's working. Keep taking it. Good fun dip. Get in that ring. That's probably how it got the name. That probably was originally a cocaine product. So, uh, despite Fritz's pushing, Mike never recovers his ability to f- perform. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, interviews with him were deeply uncomfortable affairs. Again, he is probably takes some damage to his brain from all this too uh he rants a lot on air about obscure biblical figures he also like there's one point where he's there's this documentary or something being made about him and he and uh one of his brothers are like talking in the background and it's like recorded and you can hear them talking about a gangbang that they had together he just kind of loses his ability to sort of you know filter stuff right Uh, he also has in several minor violent outbursts he's arrested a handful of times mostly for drugs this kind of all s escalates to Mike going back home after an arrest. He hikes out into the woods with a bottle of sleeping pills and he takes enough to kill himself. Uh, He is 23 years old when he dies. Now, According to some versions of the story, Mike leaves a bottle of the sleeping pills he'd used to kill himself for his youngest brother, Chris, with a note that basically says, when you're ready to go, you can use these. Now, Chris has not performed yet in the ring, um, but he takes to the ring in 1990, kind of near the end of his father's time as a wrestling baron. Nicholas Onhelm writes, or Allhelm writes, Chris grew up with severe asthma. He took prednisone for the condition from a young age, and this resulted in a smaller stature than even his brother Mike. His bones were brittle, and he broke them doing simple wrestling moves. He wasn't built to be a wrestler, but David and Mike were dead, and Kerry had taken a job in WWF. His family needed him. Already addicted to pain killers and recreational narcotics he entered the family business um he is not in there long he shoots himself in the head one year later my god Um, yeah 
1993, the last survival f- surviving wrestling Von Erich, Kerry, is arrested for cocaine possession in Dallas. The horrific pain from his foot, which had required partial amputation, pushed him into a semi-permanent state of drug abuse. Uh, after being indicted, he drove home to Denton County and his father's ch- ranch, where he shot himself in the chest with a 44 caliber revolver. He made it the longest of any of his brothers. Uh, he was 33. Um, Fritz would, in the end, outlive five of his, sorry, he has six sons. One of them does survive him. Uh, he dies of lung cancer in 1997, and good fucking riddance. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. That like, man carved uh, a, a, just a path of yeah. ruin through his sons. And if I'm understanding right, this is all just to frame Vince McMahon. Just to yes, be like, okay, is, here's the guy who's much worse than this. Yeah, Vince Vince is overall worse than this, <laughs> but you do need to know. It's not like he's not rising out of a crowd of angels. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good God. Yeah. What a fucking, series of tragedies. Yeah, that's a nightmare. <laughs> when, when you are responsible for four of your son's deaths, um, all before the age of 40. Yeah, not a and, great dad. And three of them kill themselves. Yeah. Yeah, <sighs> that's that's dark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bleak. You guys uh, got anything to plug? Uh, Tom, you go first. <laughs> oh, uh, well, <laughs> for, for, for seventy five dollars, you can take some of us here. <laughs> <laughs> for 80 bucks I'll let you hold the gun um, <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh, I like how you, I like how you pause you're like am I really gonna say this should, should, yeah. I, should I go for this <laughs> yes, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it, absolutely you know what Fritz would have done it yeah <laughs> Fritz would have yeah. done it um, yeah I've, you know you can catch me we're at Gamefully Unemployed uh, it's a podcast and streaming network right. I do with our, our former cracked co-worker and, and great buddy David Bell so check mm-hmm. that out patreon.com slash Gamefully Unemployed you can find us also on Anywhere you look yeah. for podcasts and on the social medias. That's that's pretty much it. Hell yeah, it is. Absolutely. Beautiful. And stuff. Uh, I'm at 1900hotdoc.com mm-hmm. featuring monthly columnist Tom Ryman, mm-hmm. who's yeah. great. And a lo- an all-star cast of comedy writers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do daily jokes, uh, text and pictures like the old days. And it's fantastic. Uh, I work with Robert Brockway, who's also our dear friend from Cracked. Mm-hmm. And uh, patreon.com slash 1900hotdog. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my plug. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Definitely check out Gamefully Unemployed and One Nine Hundred Hot Dog. I have one other thing to plug. Uh, this is not a, a product, a project of mine, but we will be talking. You know, Sean, in our in our episode on Steven Seagal, we chat a little bit about Judo Jean <laughs> Labelle, who, according to some versions of the story, choked Stephen out pants. so badly he pooped his pants. Now, mm. this is debated, but there is a fellow on YouTube named Bobby Fingers. Uh, Bobby is an Irish man who works, does something in the entertainment industry, like making practical effects and models. Um, I can't describe his videos better than like, he makes models of moments from pop culture history. And one of the things he does, and these, I, you should just watch them. I can't describe them better, but one of the ones he builds is a diorama of uh, Judo Jean and Steven Seagal locked in combat. Um, Go find Bobby Fingers on YouTube and watch this shit. It's genius. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I am, right. I'm writing this down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's the fucking episode, everybody. Oh, well, <laughs> didn't even get to Vince. Not, <laughs> I mean, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a, already such a long road, road strewn with bodies before we even get <laughs> so to So many this. men have died. <laughs> and we've just, we've only just begun. <laughs> 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 Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.